I wanted to um, introduce Tavis Lynch. I met him first at the Cable Foray, I think in 2017, and have seen him at a bunch of other events um, since then, including the Baronet Foray last year. Um, he is a 35 year veteran of mushroom cultivation and identification in Northwest Wisconsin. Um, he knows his mushrooms and it's just a pleasure to be out in the woods with him. Um, he's a mycology instructor for 22 schools in the upper Midwest and has been teaching for about 12 years. Uh, he's the author of a book, Mushroom Cultivation, an Illustrated Guide to Growing Your Own Mushrooms at Home, and co-author with Britt Bunyard of The Beginner's Guide to Mushrooms. So both of those are really great um, how-to guides, lots of images and tips, tricks. Um, I would encourage you to check those out. Um, he specializes in the genus Rusula and other groups. And he's the founder of the um, Northwestern Mycoenthusiast Club, which is um, a, a chapter of the Wisconsin Mycological Society, which is really close to us, kind of in that Cumberland, Baronet area. Um, there's lots of public land there. And he generously invited me to one of his meetings where they were talking about their winter foray, where they look for polypores. And I was just so intrigued and that turned into this meeting tonight. So um, I think we mentioned he's one of the founders of the Baronet Tri-County Foray. And this year will be its second year. And like Peter said, um, it's the uh, Wisconsin, um, sorry, September 8th to 11th. So it's the weekend after Labor Day. Um, and he was saying he doesn't think the polypores get the attention they deserve. So we're gonna fix that a bit tonight. Um, they're responsible for the necessary decay of dead wood in forests. And um, I know we're all used to finding the big artist conchs and other large perennial polypore, polypores, but there's a lot of minuscule ones that you might not be aware of. And uh, again, even though there's snow on the ground and we're all anxious to get out and look for morels and other spring mushrooms, we still could learn a lot about polypores by getting out there now. So Tavis, thank you again for joining us tonight. It's, it's really a treat. All right, hello everyone. My name is Tavis Lynch. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about polypores. As Kathy mentioned, there are uh, literally hundreds of species here in the upper Midwest, and we're not going to talk about all of them. In fact, we're actually going to concentrate on the, the larger and easier to find ones and just kind of do a general overview uh, because we can't talk for 20 hours about them. We don't have that kind of time allotted. So we're going to go through just some basics about polypores in Minnesota. Uh, so this was originally written for Wisconsin. And I had to make a few adjustments to make it more Minnesota specific. And you say, well, what's the, what's the big deal? What's the difference? Well, Wisconsin has two major trees that Minnesota does not. What are they? I'm not going to ask for you to answer that, but I'll give you a couple second, seconds to think about it. These are trees that are species specific to host polypores. And they are beech and hemlock. Uh, beech grows in the eastern part of Wisconsin, up the coast of Lake Michigan, and then a little bit into the Nicolay National Forest of northeastern Wisconsin. Doesn't get quite to where I'm at, but you'll see those with, uh, you'll see Maripilus, which you probably don't see in Minnesota very often. I have seen it with other trees aside from beech, uh, but I would say super rare if it's there. Uh, and then hemlock, of course, very rare in Minnesota due to overharvest and then some fires. I was reading about it just a couple of days ago. Uh, somebody had uh, told me about five years ago that there's only 22 hemlock trees in Minnesota. I couldn't find that exact number. I found one that said less than 50. I found one that said uh, up in the Cook area or the Jay Cook State Park area. Uh, I don't know how, exactly how many there are. I know there's very few, and it said that it does not look like they are reproducing. So definitely a rare tree in uh, Minnesota very common in Wisconsin. We've got hemlock cathedrals that stretch for miles here in the northern one-third of the state. These two trees do host polypores that other trees do not. So, and we'll look at a couple of those today. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it because, well, it's kind of uh, irrelevant to the polypores of Minnesota. They're polypores of Wisconsin. I do hope to see a lot of you at our two larger Wisconsin events coming up in September, uh, and then we will definitely see these mushrooms. Now, mushrooms, yeah, macrofungi, maybe we should say. Fungal fruiting bodies can have a variety of structures for spore dispersal. These are structures usually under the cap or on the underside of a mushroom that are designed to increase surface area to maximize spore production. 
We want as many spores released into the world as we can. And these structures include gills, which we're all familiar with. Those are the flat radiating plates on the underside of a cap of any of the agaric mushrooms. Uh, teeth, that's anything in the hidnaceae. Uh, your hedgehogs, uh, climacodon, uh, sarcodon. Uh, these are our tooth mushrooms, just another way of increasing surface area. Uh, ridges, like you'd see in craterellus and cantharellus, are chanterelle genera. And then pores and tubes, that's what we're looking at today. These are basically little holes on your underside of your, your we'll call it your fertile surface or your hymenium. It's all these little holes where our spores are released through. So the polyparaceae is kind of a misnomer for this lecture because uh, we're not going to be just discussing the polyparaceae. We're going to be discussing kind of polypores in general. Now, not all polypores have pores. We'll look at one of those in a minute here. Not all pored macrofungi are polypores. And not all polypores are in the polyparaceae. So why did I call it that? Eh, it was easy. Here's a gilled polypore most of us should be familiar with. Uh, I know I am. Uh, this is considered a polypore mushroom, but it has gills, right? Well, they kind of describe them as elongated pores. This is Lantanula edotes, or the common shiitake mushroom. These are mushrooms we grew actually about six feet behind where I'm sitting right now. Uh, they are considered a polypore. And they do have tougher flesh, as if anybody's out there eating them before, and I'm sure most of us have tried shiitake mushrooms. They're definitely tougher, not as tough as most polypores, but uh, they are to be considered one. What other macrofungi do we know of out in the woods that have pores? That's probably a pretty easy guess. And that is, of course, the boletes. Uh, boletes are not polypores, though they do have many pores, uh, theirs is a separable tube layer. So what separates boletes from polypores? Uh, there's a few things. Boletes have a separable layer of tubes rather than gills under the cap, mostly. There's exceptions to that, of course, in uh, Philotopsis, and I think there's a couple other genera of gilled boletes. They're easy to tell that they're boletes because if you pinch the gills, they'll also peel off as a layer like bolete pore layers do. Boletes are mycorrhizal with trees, mostly. Exceptions there, of course. I've seen Tylopolis phellius growing from decaying wood on hundreds of occasions. Uh, I have seen, well, of course, pseudo, uh, Pseudoboletus parasiticus doesn't grow on the ground at all. It grows on the fruiting body of uh, scleroderma, scleroderma citrinum, uh, the poison pigskin, whatever they call it. It looks like a puff ball. It's a little earth ball that's mycorrhizal with birch uh, and probably other trees. Uh, that one grows from the fruiting body of that. So that goes with the last one too. It grows from the ground. Boletes, mostly. Of course, exceptions being the two I just mentioned, Tylopolis uh, phellius and Pseudoboletus parasiticus, both growing from uh, somewhere other than the ground. Uh, I've also seen a uh, uh, Boletinellus crescentroides, I've seen that growing from wood probably more often than I've seen it growing from the ground. So there's exceptions to all these. We all, we're all mushroom, uh, mushroom people. We know that there aren't any hard, fast rules. There's just kind of some generalized rules that, uh, for everything. Nothing's perfect, uh, especially in the mushroom world. So this is the pore layer I'm referring to. I hope you can see my little arrow on the screen. These, this is our fertile surface here. And this is different in polypores is that it can be removed. And I know these aren't the most fabulous pictures on all occasions. Uh, some of these are, who knows when I took them. I took them on a flip phone, flip phone maybe 20 years ago. I don't, I don't know. I've got thousands of pictures to sift through, and this is the one I chose today. So that layer is separable either with your thumb or with a knife. And you can see here where I've removed it. This is Boletus nobilis for anyone that was... Curious about the species, uh, one of our edgeless clade, uh, a delicious king bolete or porcini, if you will. And we can see where I've removed that, where some of these tubes have broken away. And you can see these little lines here. Each one of those little lines is a long, hollow tube. And I suppose if your vision was good enough, you could look right through it. But on the inside of that, that's where the spores are produced. That is very similar to how a polypore works. But a polypore tends to have a non-separable layer. And there's boletes that, that don't separate. Gyrodon merilioides, the ash tree bolete that I'm sure most of us have 
seen and probably a few of us even tasted. It's it's terrible. Don't do it. Uh, that has a non-separable layer. So it's like I said, it's these these rules aren't perfect. But polypores, on the other hand, have a non-separable pore layer. I can't think of one that is separable, at least not off the top of my head. I could check my notes, but I don't, I don't know of one. Uh, they're very often saprobic, taking advantage of material that's already dead. That's not always the case. We'll learn about that in a few moments, too. And they're typically very tough fleshed, uh, some of them being hard or even harder than wood. So I get pictures all the time of these uh, perennial polypores, and they say, is it edible? It's like, wow, uh, you're the one holding it. Take a bite. See what happens. You're going to break your teeth before you're going to get a bite. So we're just going to take a look at a few polypores today, uh, maybe some uses of polypores, where to find them, things like that. Just uh, kind of a general olive overview of the polyporaceae and polypores. Now, when I'm teaching, I kind of skipped this, but I've kind of switched on when I'm teaching boletes now, I stopped teaching boletes as a family of mushrooms and I started uh, teaching it as a shape of mushrooms. Because as we're getting into all the uh, the lineage of these mushrooms and the and the true taxonomy of where they where they came from, uh, we're finding out that not all boletes are boletes. So there's a beautiful bolete that grows up in our neck of the woods, Wisconsin and Minnesota. I know it's been reported from Kansas too. I get them in my yard uh, and that's, uh, I think the common name was the leather veiled bolete, but it's a uh, paragyridon spherosporus. Uh, that one's not related to the boletes at all. It's actually in the Paxillaceae. It's related to Paxillus. So kind of a, a neat thing there. So we teach it more as a shape. And I'm going to kind of do that with the polypores too, because some of these today are not in the polyporaceae, but they're polypores. Some polypores out there are not saprobic. They're in fact uh, parasitic or even pathogenic. Now we all know what a parasite is. A parasite is a tick or a leech. It's something uh, sucking the life away from another living entity, something drawing its energy or its, uh, its nutrition away. A pathogen works in a different way. A pathogen actually kills every cell that it touches. And pathogenic mushrooms are important. Uh, they play an important role in the forest ecosystem, managing populations. So if we didn't have certain uh, pathogenic polypores, the only tree we would see here might be uh, quaking aspen. And for a healthy forest to work, you know, a healthy forest ecosystem, tree diversity is key. We want, we want tree diversity. So we're looking for uh, forest diversity. I would say if you walked into a forest and there was only one species of tree, that to me says something's wrong. So we've got these pathogenic and parasitic mushrooms in there. Uh, and they kind of help manage that, those numbers. Uh, one of the most common and rarely included in field guides is, uh, I got switch, there it is, uh, is Philanus tremuli. This grows on aspens uh, across America. Now where we're at here, I find it, I did a little bit of a survey in my woods, my parents' woods, a couple of woods around here where there was dense stands of mature aspen. And I was seeing it at a rate of about one tree to every 30 or 40 has this on it. So about one in 40 stems, you're going to see Philinus tremulae managing that population. That's the fruiting body. That's not to say it's not on all of them. And that's why, you know, they say, oh, aspen doesn't live very long. Well, a lot of that's because of this little guy right here. This is a pathogenic fungus controlling our populations, basically. Now, I tried to survey the same thing in Colorado, and it was a lot tougher there because it was far less common. But boy, Colorado, where I was at, the, uh, the terrain was a lot more rugged. The tree diversity was far lower. You know, in, in some of these woods, there might only be four species of tree. Aspen growing everywhere and growing up to uh, pretty high elevation. I mean, we found aspen up as high as Oh, 10,600 feet, I suppose, maybe even higher. Uh, but we weren't seeing the Philinus tremulae on it as much. I would say out there, the rate was closer to one in 400 stems. So it's just not as necessary out there, or it doesn't do as well due to the, the more rugged conditions. I'm not really sure on that. But I know here in Wisconsin and Minnesota, it's quite common. Uh, I don't know that it has any, any use uh, 
it's just, I think it's very pretty. It's got a neat smoky gray color, like, like most Philinas do, or, or Virchondria. We've got one of those right here. I don't know if you can see that or not, but that was a uh, one that grew in as a crust. It was a little tougher for us to identify. It came in at one of our winter polypore forays we had about three weeks ago. But most polypores are saprobic. Uh, they're responsible for breaking down woody debris in the forest. This is where our forest nutrition comes from. You know, when a tree dies, you need uh, fungi and other microorganisms to break that down and make it usable for future plant life. Uh, some polypores, we call them the brown rotters, only break down and digest cellulose, leaving behind the lignin. So wood is essentially two ingredients, lignin bound together by cellulose. Um, these are called, this after the a brown rotter comes through, it just digests all the cellulose, leaving behind what we call BCR or brown cubicle rot. Uh, this is caused by the brown rotters. And here is a photo of BCR. Uh, it's kind of cool. It's like little building blocks in the woods. We see that a lot. Uh, Larry Evans from Montana does a uh, quite a quite a lengthy lecture on BCR. Uh, if you're ever in for a, a lecture that has even songs included in it, he's always entertaining to listen to. Uh, he's certainly more knowledgeable on its uh, role in the ecosystem than I am. But yeah, we'll see this in the woods. This is caused by a brown rotting polypore, typically. Many polypores are laterally attached. Uh, that means <clears throat> they have no stem attaching them to their host tree. And most polypores are growing on wood. There are a few that grow from the ground. It's far less common. Uh, the term for this is a stipitate, meaning without stem, without stipe. Uh, the attachment point can be very broad and strong, uh, occasionally even strong enough that you can climb on them. And we've all seen pictures of somebody sitting on them, or we've tried to climb a tree maybe with just grabbing the Ganoderma and seeing how high you can get before they break off. Or I've seen guys try to do pull-ups on them before. And yeah, some of them are, are attached with a uh, incredibly tenacious bond. This being one of the most common, it was kind of funny when I was going through my uh, show today, I was looking for pictures. This is one of the most common polypores in the world. And this is the best picture of it I had. I couldn't believe that. So I got to put that on my list of better pictures to take. But this is Ganoderma oplanatum. It's our, the artist's conch, as many people call it. It's uh, related to uh, the reishi mushrooms. In fact, I've heard this referred to as the brown reishi. I don't know uh, much about its medicinal properties. I do have a friend that would drink it as a tea, and she said it would put her to sleep. So I don't, I don't know if that was... Uh, placebo effect or or if it did have some effect on her. Uh, I've never tried it. Uh, I have no problem sleeping. So we're going to see this on hardwoods in almost any forest system. I don't get over to Minnesota incredibly often. I do spend a little time up in the Reamer area and a little bit into the Superior National Forest occasionally. And then in the spring, I find myself off and down in the Zumbro River Valley uh, looking for morels down there, but wow, so is every other person in Minnesota. It gets pretty crowded down there. Or the uh, the White River, Whitewater River State Park down near uh, uh, be west of Wabasha, down in that area. I've spent some time down there too. It's down there. This mushroom is everywhere. I've seen it north. I've seen it south. Uh, certainly showing preference to oak, but I've seen it on birch and, and certainly other hardwoods, uh, even maples. Now this is a perennial, as many polypores are, and I'm sorry for the blurry picture, but every year that this mushroom grows, it puts on a new fertile surface, along with a sterile backing. So the thinner lines here is your pore layer. So this is the fresh one. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, maybe six. This mushroom might be in its sixth year of life. So if you're ever out in the woods, and I, I promise to get a better picture of this. Um, crack one open. Yeah, see how old it is or how old it was. If you find a dead one, it might be a little bit uh, more ethical to harvest a, a dead one than one that's still adding layers. Many polypores have a centrally located stem. Now, those we don't see as often, but we've got a few common ones. Uh, one that always uh, confuses people is uh, Polyporus radicatus, which uh, grows from the ground with a long root. Looks like a bolete. Yeah, it's not. 
or uh, uh, let's see, Bolitopsis grizzia. We see that one very rarely, but we do see it. Uh, that's not a bolete. I would consider that a polypore rather than a bolete. It looks like a bolete. That's where it gets its name, Bolitopsis. I guess I'm not really sure on its on its lineage. But I would say it's it's a it's a polypore. It's not a bolete. It's not in the the bolitaceae for sure. It's not in the family. Um, it's certainly not in the genus Boletus proper. So we've got some of these centrally located stems. This one's one I see a lot, and that's uh, Lentinus brumalis, or there's another one in the spring, Lentinus arcularius. Uh, this one is surprisingly dark brown. Usually this mushroom is almost purple. They're very pretty. They're small. They're very tough. And they grow on extremely decayed wood, as you can see here, mossy wood, wood that's been uh, already touched by a primary decomposer. You don't usually see it on fresh fallen logs. You see it on logs that have been on the ground in contact with, with the soil for a while. So we know there's other invaders in there. I mean, this thing is moss covered. It's probably been on the ground for five or more years, maybe 10 years. Uh, and they don't get very big, but they're always cool to see. You know, it's kind of a, a stumper for a lot of people. It was formerly Poliparus brumalis. It got moved into Lentinus, which was kind of the, the dump for a while where everything got thrown in. Uh, you know, these come into the forays all the time, and somebody's like, I don't know what kind of a bully this is growing on wood. Well, it's not a bully. It's a polypore. You know, it does not have a separable layer. They're a pretty little mushroom. I like finding them. Uh, this one is beautiful. Residolia craterella, formerly Poliparus craterellus. Uh, often mistaken for uh, pheasant's back mushrooms. And they do kind of look like that. And I think that they may have even been in that, in that genus, Seriporus, for a while. I don't, uh, I don't remember, but I believe they were. And now they, they've erected a new genus, I think, just for this mushroom, as far as I know. Very rare, uh, very pretty. This is a, I wish I had a better photo than that. It's the best one I had. I got a dozen photos of it. And honestly, this is the best one. I got to pay more attention to that when I'm in a hurry. But yeah, this one was brought in one of the one of the northern Wisconsin forays last year. We found it. It may have been Baronet. It may have been Hiles. I don't recall. We we found it a few times last year. It's never common. It's always exciting when it comes in because you know a lot of people don't know what it is. They're like, I found a pheasant's back, but it's perfectly round with a centrally located stem. Well, then it's something else. That's Brezidolia. So yeah, always a very cool mushroom to see. I encourage everyone to get out and hunt for it. Once you find it, it's totally worth it. They're just always so pretty. Some polypores are viewed as medicine. Uh, I kind of looked across the attendance list tonight. And I was really surprised at uh, how many people on the that are here tonight have been in the woods with me and probably argued medicinal mushrooms with me before. Uh, I'm not saying mushrooms are not medicinal. That I won't say. Uh, I just think some of it gets blown a little bit out of proportion. Uh, you know, I'll drink uh, I'll drink chaga tea every day because uh, I like the taste. Is it going to cure all my woes? Probably not. Uh, I know there's been a little bit of laboratory proof of that. I just want to see more. Uh, anecdotal evidence isn't good enough for me. So I, I hope it's I hope it's all true. I honestly do. Just as of right now, I'm a, I'm a little skeptical a little skeptical on the amount of claims that some of these mushrooms are getting. So that's where, I'll, that's where I'll stand on that. You guys can argue with me if you want. That'll be fun. But yeah, just my, uh, my opinion. I want to see facts first. That's just kind of the way I operate. And I think we all should. I think we should question everything until we know. Uh, using mushrooms for medicine goes back centuries. Uh, the presumed medical or medicinal properties of these mushrooms ranges everywhere from blood sugar balance to anti-tumor uh, to immunoboosting uh, to the acceleration of neurogenesis. Now that one, I was just reading a couple articles recently about how uh, mushrooms in the genus Heresium had sped up the maturation of oligodendrocytes uh, by encasing nerve endings in myelin basic protein. Did it make the nerves heal? No, but it put together both elements that are necessary for nerves to heal. So there's definitely medicinal potential there. And I hope they really continue to push that research and figure out if there's a way to utilize that effectively. Some of those medicinal mushrooms, of course, are the turkey tail, Trimides versicolor. Super common, very pretty. Uh, I've tried the tea. I don't care for it. It doesn't have much of a flavor at all, and the flavor it does have, I don't find it to be that pleasant. I know some people enjoy it, but I, I do not. 
Uh, always a pretty mushroom to find. Lots of uh, lots of lookalikes, we'll call them, including Sterium and Tricaptum, uh, even Microspora. Uh, what's another one? Poronidulus. Yeah, there's a few that look like it. If it's something you're interested in, I uh, I can certainly help you go through all the rules on how to identify it accurately, uh, but we won't have time for that today. So turkey tail, Tremise versicolor, certainly recognized as a medicinal mushroom. Uh, the king of all, Inonotus obliquus, the chaga. Now this isn't really a mushroom, it's actually a sclerotium. It's an energy cell or a a mass of hyphal tissues bound together to store up energy to produce a fruiting body. I've only seen the fruiting body of chaga twice in my life, and I've got one really garbage photo of it that I'll show you in a second here. Uh, chaga, very common on trees in the birch family. I mostly see it on white birch and yellow birch, but I've also seen it on hop hornbeam or ironwood, if you will, uh, also in the birch family. I've heard reports of it on beech and other trees. I've never seen that, but I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm sure it's pretty well documented that uh, that it does happen. Here is the photo I've got of the development of a fruiting body, and there's not much to see there. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, it was just cool to see it. The other time I saw it, it didn't look much better than this. But if you get a chance, Google Chaga fruiting body. It is the most beautiful, shimmering silver coat of a polypore that, that exists. They're just spectacular. They look otherworldly. And there's only about a half a dozen pictures even on Google of it. So it's not seen very often. It happens under the bark after the tree is fully dead. And, and chaga is a parasite. It is killing that tree. And sometimes it could take 30 or 40 years, I suppose, to kill that tree. And then it produces its fruit, uh, fruiting body. It's not in a hurry. But yeah, get uh, if, you, if you remember after tonight, uh, when you're sitting around saying, what am I going to Google next? Google chaga fruiting body. And these silvery, shimmery, uh, porous surfaces are, are quite incredible. I, I hope to see one someday. I'm still looking so I can replace this photo. Now, here's one you're not going to get in Minnesota. Ganoderma sugi. This grows exclusively on eastern hemlock. I don't know that the limited number of hemlocks in Minnesota have any of this growing. Uh, I would be nervous if they did. You know, it's... Um, deleterious to the tree's health you know this is a parasite and it will turn saprobic after the tree is dead also but it'll grow on living trees and it is uh it is slightly injuring them it's just it's a weak parasite but you'll definitely see it on the dead tissues uh i have tried the tea from this it's more commonly referred to of course as reishi or reishi however you choose to pronounce it uh this tea tastes terrible i'll be quite honest i don't enjoy it at all but i'll tell you what i can feel the effects of this mushroom when I drink the tea uh, in the sense that are very similar to caffeine. I get a, I don't get jittery or anything, but I, I do get a uh, kind of a, an extra little bit of life, a little bit of energy, we'll say. Helps me uh, stay alert if I'm driving a long distance. But it does taste very foul. I don't care how much honey and sugar you put in it, you're going to taste its bitterness. And maybe somebody has a better recipe they can send me someday, but uh, for now, I just choose to skip it. So this one is not one you're going to see in Minnesota. You'll definitely see it in Wisconsin. Anybody that attends uh, the Northwoods Foray or the Baronet Tri-County Foray uh, or the Hiles Foray, I mean, that's a long drive for you guys, but uh, it's very common in those regions because hemlock is very common. A very tiny percentage of polypores are actually poisonous. Uh, not very many. I can only think of two off the top of my head, and they are both in the genus Hapalopolis. Uh, so this one just recently got a new name. This is Hapalopolis rutilans, former, formerly Nidulans was the epithet. Uh, it's just kind of a nondescript little blob of brown. Uh, definitely has an irregular pore surface. They're always oddly shaped, and you know, there's nothing ever real concrete about, about how you would describe their shape. I find them mostly on the twigs of birch trees uh, or the twigs of other hardwoods. I don't often see it on stumps or larger pieces of wood. And I wish it showed up better here. In the bottom right corner, you'll see a dot. And that's where I just put a tiny drip of potassium hydroxide on it, and it turns an absolutely beautiful royal purple color. I should have done a big streak across here, but I didn't know I was going to be using this photo for 
uh, you can tell it was taken on a paper plate at a foray. I might have better pictures of it now, I don't recall. But it is pretty spectacular. And this is one of the mushrooms that can be used to dye fibers like wool or cotton. So on that note, some polypores can be used to dye fibers. Uh, I've never done this. I don't recording know. Recording in know. progress. Okay, uh, recording in progress. Thank you. Uh, I know Arlene Bissett wrote a book on how to do it. I think there's a couple other dyeing books out there. Uh, not my hobby, but uh, if you're into it, cool. These might be some to know. That one we just passed, of course, uh, Hapalopolis uh, Rutilins is used for dyeing fibers, as is the dyer's polypore, uh, Phyllis schweinitzii. This grows at the base of mostly white pines, but this one is actually growing at the base of some uh, Norway spruce, a non-native tree often planted as an ornamental or a, actually probably a windbreak around farms uh, 200 years ago. Uh, we still see them. They're still sold, I'm sure. They're not invasive, but uh, non-native. And I, I know that they'll host them. Uh, because this one here, I just took this picture last summer, uh, and it was growing in an area that was exclusively Norway spruce. So we know it grows with other hosts besides white pine. And this makes a couple different colored dyes, I think yellow and brown, and, and maybe maybe one of the brighter colors. It all depends on what your mordant is or what chemical you're, you're preparing it with. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about that. I, I really don't know much about dyeing fibers with mushrooms. I have no use for it. There's a puffball that they do too. And there's there's some agarics that work as well, some lactarius and whatnot. Uh, so if you're interested in that, yeah, this is a mushroom to know. And maybe pick up uh, one of those books that can help you learn about that, because I can't. Now, this is probably most of our favorite parts. Uh, some polypores are excellent edibles. And it just dawned on me, I forgot one of my favorites, uh, the Ishnoderma resinosum. Uh, I did not include that in tonight's presentation, but I'm sure all of us are thinking about the same three mushrooms, edible polypores. Uh, one that I actually do find in Minnesota more often than I find in Wisconsin is uh, uh, Poliparis umbilatus, the umbrella polypore. It looks very similar to this one, Griffola frondosa, the maitake, the dancing lady, the sheep's head, the ram's head, uh, the hen of the woods, uh, the dancing mushroom, all kinds of names for this thing. Uh, fairly common around mature oak trees. We definitely find a lot in this neighborhood. I found a lot in Minnesota as well in the, in the limited time that I've been there. Uh, always a favorite. Boy, I don't know very many people that don't like this mushroom. Always a great find. So that if somebody said edible polypores, this would be the first one that popped into my head. Uh, of all the mushrooms I've tried, I, I still rate this one very highly. I think I've eaten, I don't know, maybe 150 or 160 species of mushrooms in Wisconsin. And I would say this one's probably in my top, maybe top five, uh, top 10 for sure. Excellent mushroom. Another one people think of right away is the other poultry, the chicken mushroom, Letoporus sulfurius. Now in Wisconsin, we have three species of Letoporus. In Minnesota, you have two species of Letoporus. So you've got Letoporus sulfurius, the bright yellow underside, the orange upper side, uh, typically growing on red oaks, but I have seen it on white pine. I have seen it on birch. I've seen it on aspen. I've seen it on other species of oak. I've seen it on my garage door. Uh, I've seen it on basswood. It grows everywhere, but I would say 75% of the time or more, it's going to be on something in the red oak group, uh, being red oak, black oak, or pin oak. Pin oak is yeah, a, a superb host for it. Now, some people do have reactions to this. Um, these numbers are my numbers. I'm sure that somebody else could probably do a more accurate study, but I figure about 10% of the population struggles with this mushroom, uh, causing some, uh, we'll just say causing some problems. Nothing serious, but discomfort and maybe uh, a condition we call the quick step. So be cautious your first time eating it. The other one that you have in Minnesota is Letoporus cincinnatus, uh, the white chicken, which has a very pale cream creamy orange, peachy kind of color on top. And then the underside is practically white. It does have a little hint of a peachy color to it. Uh, less common, usually growing from uh, subterranean wood, like buried roots or, or buried wood. Uh, this one happened to grow in my backyard 
on a red oak that had been down for many years. And it was huge. I mean, this picture doesn't really show it, but it's, I mean, this is almost probably almost six feet wide. It was a monster. This one is superior to this one. It really is in flavor and texture. And I, we don't find it enough here for me to really get any good numbers on it. Uh, but I don't know anybody that gets sick from this one. So kind of a, kind of a nice mushroom to find. I'm honestly not a huge fan of the chicken mushroom, but I do really enjoy the white chicken mushroom. I, I do prefer it. Uh, it's in my opinion, uh, far superior. Now we have a third chicken mushroom in Wisconsin. And of course it grows on hemlock. Uh, there's been debate on, does it grow on other conifers? I've never seen any reports that it has. I've heard people just say, oh, I've seen it on white pine. Well, I've seen sequences of sulfurous on white pine. I've never seen a sequence of sulfurous on hemlock. I've seen Huroniensis is our third species, Lidoporus Huroniensis. I've seen that exclusively on hemlock. And I, I'm just going to go ahead and say it probably is exclusive to hemlock. People that are finding chicken mushrooms on white pine, it's very likely still Lidoporus sulfurious. So another one. Yeah, and I've actually eaten it. Uh, I've heard a lot of places don't recommend it. Uh, I know of a handful of people that have tried it, and I and I'm going to say that the uh, the get sick rate on Lidoporus huroniensis, which is not pictured here, uh, is closer to 50 percent, where people get a little bit of gastric distress from it, uh, maybe even some uh, vomiting. It happens very soon after consuming. So, is it a poisonous mushroom? No, it. Uh, it can be linked to a lot of things. I've heard the theory that it's probably an enzyme deficiency in our own body and our body recognizes something it can't break down and it hits the eject button. Makes sense to me. So it's more of an intolerance than an allergy or a, uh, a toxin. So definitely worth looking for. They're always pretty. They're easy to find because they're bright orange. You can see them from a quarter mile in the woods. Now, some trees are known for their polypores. Birch is a great example. Uh, birch has a handful of species that are exclusive to birch or very close to exclusive, showing strong preference, we'll say. First one up is Fomatopsis betulina. Uh, this one is exclusive to birch. Uh, it's known as the birch polypore. Uh, always kind of a neat mushroom. Uh, I have actually tried to eat this one. It was tough, uh, but it was... It was very tasty. I was surprised. So you really got to cut it into thin ribbons if you're going to consume it. Uh, I know that it's got some supposed medicinal properties as well. And the older books say that the surface could also be used as a strop for a knife. Uh, I've tried that. I can't really tell you if it worked or not. It didn't leave any discoloration like it was removing any metal. Uh, but is it aligning the, the microfibers of steel at the edge of my blade? Maybe. Uh, I keep my knives pretty sharp, and I've I've played around with it. And I can't tell you really if it if it did much of anything, but it's it's one of those things to to play with when you're in, when you're in the woods. And after seeing this picture, I'm sure most of us have come up with what the next one is going to be, and that is the American Fomes excavatus. These are very young specimens, so they're they're very brown. I hear this one get called uh, the horse's hoof a lot, uh, or the tinder conch. And if you're in a pickle in the woods and you need to start a fire, uh, I have done this demonstration many times where you crack this open and the fibers on the inside will take a spark very readily. <clears throat> so if you've got a, a ferroceramic rod or uh, any way to throw sparks, even flint and stone, if you can get a spark to land on those fibers, they do they do smolder. You can transfer to you can transfer an ember to a larger source and get fire from that. Also, the uh, fabric amadou, <clears throat> excuse me, is made from the fibers on the interior of this mushroom. Amadou is kind of like a, kind of like felt. Uh, Paul wears his amadou hat proudly. Uh, and he's made reference to how flammable it is. He says his hat has caught fire from ashes of cigarettes uh, being dropped on it. I don't know. I don't know if I would wear a flammable hat, but uh, you can if you want. Definitely stylish and Definitely cool to be wearing something made from uh, the fruiting body of a fungus. I think that's kind of neat. Tricaptum biformi. Uh, I see it mostly on birch or aspen. It's on aspen a lot. I do see it on oak occasionally. 
This is arguably the most common mushroom body, mushroom fruiting body in northern in the northern hemisphere. We'll say so. I'm not talking biomass, but by fruiting body count, I would say Tricaptum biformia is probably the most common mushroom in the jungle here. And like I said, I do see it on uh, birch and aspen mostly, but I've seen it on oak. I've seen it on other hardwoods. If you find it on a conifer, it's Tricaptum uh, abiotinum, uh, which we mostly see it on uh, balsam fir over here. And I know you've got plenty of balsam fir in Minnesota. I see a lot of it in the Reamer area where I do a little bit of uh, black mirror hunting in the spring and a little bit of Matsutake hunting in the fall. Oh, did I let that secret out? Sure I did. Go get them. All polypores, uh, no matter what their, their lifestyle and their life cycle is, are critical to the health of a forest ecosystem. We need our decomposers. We got to have that. Uh, we need our parasites and pathogens for population management. If we didn't have that, Minnesota would be one big aspen forest. You know, we have to have these, these regulators in here. Uh, they're also you know, often the only macrofungi we can find during dry summers, you know, where you do these forays. It's like, man, we're not finding anything. Start looking for polypores. Uh, now, the Northwest Wisconsin Micro Enthusiast Club uh, for the last two years has been doing a winter polypore hike in February, and it's been really fun. This year was a little bit uh, low on attendance, but uh, probably due to a scheduling error, not a big deal. Last year, it was very well attended. Uh, the uh, Wisconsin Mycological Society just did one in January uh, down in the Janesville area, southern Wisconsin, extreme southern Wisconsin. And I mean, we had 30 or 40 people in the woods for a couple hours and we ended up finding, oh, I don't remember the exact count, right around 20 different species of, of mushroom, crusts and polypores, almost all of them. were. We found a couple of dried up oyster mushrooms that we had to count. But yeah, we were finding polypores. They can be found all year long. You know, everybody complains, I got cabin fever, I can't go mushroom hunting. Sure you can. Get out of the house, go find a polypore. You know, that first picture I showed of Felinus tremuli, that was, that picture was taken in February. You know, there, there's things to get out there and things to learn about. And a lot of times when we're doing species documentation at these forays, some of these polypores get skipped. You know, because, oh yeah, we've already seen that one. Well, it still has to come in. We have to record these species when we're, when we're doing surveys of our, of our species here when we're documenting that. So I decided in our club, we're gonna do them in the winter. That way, if they get skipped in the summer, no big deal. So a mushroom season never needs to end in Minnesota. Get out of the house, go find a polypore. And always remember, uh, polypores are almost as cool as Rochelle. Uh, I thank everyone very much for coming tonight. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Anybody has any questions? Uh, my name is Tavis. I own Tavis's Mushrooms. This is my email address. I'll leave this up for a couple minutes. Uh, that's my phone number, but I can't receive pictures on that phone. So send to my Facebook at Tavis Lynch or my Facebook at Tavis's Mushrooms or email them to me at mushroomtavis at gmail.com uh, for any ID requests or if you want to take a walk in the woods, I'm always up for that. Uh, tour of the farm, doesn't matter. I'm always up for doing something mushroom related every day of the year. Uh, and if you want... Uh, any additional information about anything else, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to respond. Anyone have any any questions? I'm, I'm kind of peeking at the chat here. Um, lots of thank yous, and that was great. I, I will um, second what you said, Tavis. I remember, uh, gosh, I it was pretty early on. I had joined the Minnesota Mycological Society. We went on a fall for a I'm hoping to find hen of the woods and it was just dry, dry, dry. And I don't know, a handful of people showed up and Ron Spinoza started teaching us polypores. And I learned more that day than I had learned on the days uh, where we were finding the fleshy fungi, just because we really focused on them. It's, I think it's, it's a, sure, an yeah. Opportunity. yeah, that's <clears throat> kind of the advantage of the drier years. These mushrooms do get some attention and I'm not a huge polypore guy. Uh, but you got to like them all a little bit. You know, I much prefer the mushrooms of August and September, but yeah, it gets me out of the house. I yeah. feel like it's a good intro to ID too. I, for some reason, when I first started to, I thought that they were maybe a little easier to get my brain around. Um, a lot of the, you know, when yeah, a lot yeah. of the fleshy fungi are at the same time, it, it gets overwhelming. Um, and yeah, it, I felt like they were a good intro as well. 
that's interesting. I've never looked at it that way. Uh, I think that's a good uh, a good idea. Yeah, because there are fewer groups. You know, you kind of narrow them down. Uh, I like that. And I'm going to second that um, second year favorite mushroom as hen of the woods. I I still think it's my They're favorite. Great. I just yeah. I have to eat it. And I challenge anyone who says I don't like mushrooms. I want them to try one and then tell me they don't like mushrooms. Definitely so. Yeah. Definitely so. Yeah, that could be a game changer for a lot of people. Cool. Um, did you want to share any other info about uh, the Baronet Foray? I, I really enjoyed uh, the format of that, how um, it was at a um, community center. So there was a lot of community. Um, there were forays that had um, vans or you could follow in a car. Um, I feel like there was everyone ate together in the evening and then you were kind of on your own for um, for breakfast and lunch. So there was there's enough planned activities, but there was also a lot of um, personal time, which I think, um, I mean, I love, love the Nama forays, but sometimes I end up being exhausted from them because I try to do everything, sure. <laughs> go to every lecture. <laughs> there is a website. Uh, I'm not sure if Melissa Perry is still with us. She designed. I'm with you. Okay. So we've got our website for the Baronet Tri-County Foray. For any of those, anyone that's interested in attending. Yeah, it was an excellent event. We got it was dry last year, but we still found, I think the final count was 222 species of mushroom, including two species that neither Patrick nor I could identify. So that's always fun. Uh, it's all easy walking. Everything's within, honestly, everything's within 100 yards of the community center. Uh, there was free camping. Uh, it was it was just really nice. There's three restaurants right there and a, and a beautiful organic grocery store. And I know Kathy will back me up on this with the best frozen custard in the world. It's so good. And, and it was, it was just a very friendly event. It was a beginner's event for sure. And we're going to try to keep it that way. There's certainly advanced people there, but uh, we want it to be beginner friendly and, and open to the public uh, for everyone. Melissa, do you want to share the, um, the website with me? I'll, I'll, I could do a screen share. If um, actually it's not live quite yet um okay. i have it like in it's like final stages being built i'm adding some of the staff information to yeah. it so um i think the best bet actually at this point is to request that people follow our facebook page and i will be um putting the link to the website on the facebook page in probably the next like week or two um and then you can actually register this year we're not going to be doing like the event right type registration we're going to actually go through the website directly so when that is finally published and up and ready it'll have like all of our event information as far as our speakers and stuff like that and then it'll also be like just the place where you can um register as well so it'll kind of be like a one-stop shop for everybody but yeah we've got some great people like barbara ching actually just today said that she's probably going to do one of our keynotes and stuff um so it should be really really great Great. Yeah, and everyone, everyone here, consider yourself personally invited. Check it out. Yeah, on Facebook, I guess is the best way now. Baronet Tri County Foray is the page, and that's September yeah, eighth through the eleventh. I would say just save every weekend in September because there's something <laughs> cool going on. <laughs> She's right. Uh, okay. If I don't see any questions, I'm going to leave. I want to thank everyone. We had uh, quite an attendance tonight. That was uh, that was excellent. And thank you very much, yeah. Kathy and Peter. I, hey, I appreciate it. I got one, one oh. uh, question popping up in the chat here. What woods are best for hunting mushrooms? Is it the more diverse the trees, the better? And that's if you're talking. Scott. Yeah, if you're talking summer mushrooms, absolutely. Summer mushrooms require, mycorrhizal mushrooms I'm talking now, require different species of trees to be successful. So they'll reach out to this tree and this tree you know, maybe a birch and an oak, or maybe even a, a birch and a pine. So anytime you see tree diversity, you're going to see more mushroom diversity on the ground. As far as polypores go, they're either very species specific, or they grow on everything. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter as much for, for what we were discussing tonight. But certainly in the in the summer and early autumn, when we're seeing mushrooms in, in Minnesota and Wisconsin, which our mushroom season here is short, we all know that, you know, where I live, I'm, I'm, you know, in the northern quarter of the state, my mushroom season is from mid-July to mid-September. Two months is all I get to for my favorite 
my favorite thing in the world is mushrooms and I can only do it one sixth of the year up here, you know, unless we're counting polypores. So yeah, for those mushrooms, definitely forest diversity or when you see two types of forests collide. That's why Northern Wisconsin is so diverse is because we've got boreal forest meets uh, Minnesota big woods, uh, secondary broadleaf forest. So at these tension lines or these collision points, you'll see incredible mushroom diversity, including, you know, finding new species up here is, is not rare at all. You know, I've got, uh, I've found two for sure. Britt Bunyard's found at least two. Uh, there was a, a, a Pluteus found in Northeastern Wisconsin on these tension lines. Yeah, you, you're gonna definitely find more mushrooms where there's more tree diversity. I, I'm kind of familiar with some of that, yeah. I would, I would say, um, second what you said, um, Tavis, that it kind of depends on what you're looking for, right? If you're really interested in finding that big maitake, you're gonna wanna look where there's oak or same with like the, the chicken of the woods. And I think a lot of times you just start to get used to um, when it's time to look for something, right? Like we have some new members that sometimes are like, I think I found a morel and it'll be September. And you start to get used to knowing what comes out in what season and what you're used to seeing and then start marking your, your favorite spots or even your favorite trees. I know a lot of people use GPS tracking and might find something like, like that big tree in your yard with the, um, the Cincinnatus. It's like, I'm sure you go back and peek for it every year because be, being a parasite, it's going to show up again if the conditions are right. Absolutely. Uh, I just figured out how the chat works. I'm not real good at this. Oh. Uh, and I see Scott Benjamin asking, thanks for the great info. Do you have any identification books that you feel are best? I, I've got a, a massive library of them right next to me. And always the first book I go to is the Timothy Baroni book. I just, I find, I like the way it's laid out. I like the photos. Uh, I like the info that he's got there. It's not perfect for our area, but it's very, very good. And it's called Mushrooms of the Northeastern United States and Eastern Canada. And I think there's probably about 700 species in there or something. Uh, I would say 90% uh, of it is relevant to our area also, 85 to 90%. So that's the first one I grab. but uh, geez, I... If it's not in here, then I grab the full book or I, or I grab Kathy's book or I grab the Phillips book. You know, there's or you can get family specific books. I got Agaricus, Amanita, the Bolites, the Ascos, the Trikes, the Waxies, the Milks, more Milks, Ebolomas, Polypores, Polypores. You know, just those are all great, too, if you can identify it down to a family or even a genus. Uh, then one of those, certainly. But if I was going to bring just just one book to this part of the country, it would be the Timothy Baroni book, to be honest. Yeah, I like that one too. And he's a nice guy. So there's that too. Oh, well, certainly. Yeah. And I've never met him personally, but I've never heard anything but excellent things about him. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Davis. Take care. Thanks, Peter. Bye bye. Bye.